and thank you all for coming tonight to uh, listen to a poor speaker get up and talk a little bit about technology. Maybe before I get started, uh, get a show of hands. How many people are in the oil and gas industry in the crowd? And how many people inside of this group are technology people inside of that oil and gas industry? Okay. Any students or people? Okay, good. So uh, the introduction I think was a good one because I'm not a technology guy. Although I've run IT groups uh, since 1991 inside of this world and I can't tell too many lies because one of my compatriots from those days is in town so he's sitting in the audience so I have to be very careful about being truthful about everything I say. Um, let me give you a little bit of my background so you know a little bit about me. Uh, I came to Calgary in 1979 and I worked for Gulf Canada Resources for 18 years. The last three years that I worked for Gulf Canada Resources I was running the IT shop and we had gone from a Canadian only company to a worldwide company I think operating in 17 or 18 different locations around the globe. Um, my job at the time and I remember this very clearly when I took over IT is my boss came to me and said I need a budget and of course you go back and you do 5% reduction and hope that the guy says it's okay and he proceeded to tell me he says I don't know what you're doing but he said our company can't afford that and you've got to cut your cost by 50% and you've got a week to do it and if you can't do it I'll find somebody else who can. And so I proceeded from that point on for three years to take a budget of 25 million dollars and 120 people on staff and in three years time we'd gone from mainframe only to client server. We'd done a whole bunch of other standardization within the industry and we went to 11.7 .7 million dollars in costs, had 42 people on staff and we had a network operating center in Jakarta, Calgary and London, England. And so when I think about myself and I think about the changes and the things that we do, I don't think of myself as a technology person, I don't think of myself as a CFO, I think about myself as a change agent that makes money for people. And so this slide is going to talk to you a little bit about our journey at NEL. That's just, and the other thing you should know about me is I love to tell stories, so I'll tell lots of stories and uh, hopefully um, I find it's, a, it's probably a, an interesting way for you to remember what I actually say and how it actually works. So here's my story about NEL. I came to NEL in 2006. December of 2006, I used to work for the Irvings. There's another story if you want to go into that story too. But uh, I came in 2006, we were a sleepy little oil and gas company. Um, uh, this company has been around since 1990. It's owned by Manulife and it was a public entity. There was two actually firms involved. We were producing about 30,000 barrels of oil a day when I arrived. We reached about 50,000 barrels of oil a day. We sold the public side of the company for $1.9 billion. We then built up the private side of the business from about 15,000 barrels a day to where we are today at about 47,000 barrels. What I found when I came here was a company ran on spreadsheets and I'll just give you an example. We have a half million spreadsheets inside of our company, about 60,000 active at any time. Try to do data science on spreadsheets. <laughs> it's a very difficult thing. But let me give you a sense of the way it's changed and what's happening inside of the world of technology and how things are progressing and quite dramatically. And I think this may be the most exciting time we're gonna see inside of this industry. Although I would say our industry has still not progressed to the place where I think it should be and at the speed that I think we are demanding that it go. But let me talk a little bit about the company and who we are. We are a full service, top 30 oil and gas producer in Canada. We're a private company owned by Manulife. We had 39,000 barrels of production. We have rail terminals, truck terminals, processing activities, and we do drilling and completions. And we're very proud that the only thing that we don't have is a lawyer. We have every other, everything else that every other oil and gas upstream company would have. I took this, uh, I stole this shamelessly from Peter Terzakian. And Peter put out an article, and the article is called uh, uh, Tough Medicine. And this is why I think we need to go faster and harder and, and for a bigger reason. The thing that stands out for me in this slide is if you look at the bottom right hand corner on the historical equity performance, and you may not be able to read this, but the red line on the bottom is the Canadian oil and gas index. At the very bottom. Guess what the line on the top is? Coal. 
it seems to be a dichotomy that coal is at the top of this list, and yet we have GHGs and uh, carbon and things that we have to deal with. So we are being punished in the industry in a massive way. Politics are getting to us. The rules and regulations are changing by the minute. Uh, we're just having a quick conversation about that. Don't know where they're going to end, don't know where we're going to get to, but we know they're going to be a lot tougher than they are today. The commodity price, although it has recovered, it will never probably recover back to the place that we used to see it at $100 oil. That is not going to happen in our lifetime. And for those of you that are in the industry will know that just last weekend, gas was trading at three cents. So we're not doing really well on the gas side either. So commodity prices are in the tank. And we have massive social pressure. We have lost the fight for the social high ground in terms of continuing to do uh, uh, sell fossil fuels. We are very much in the defense around this particular position. So that means for us as an industry, we have to change. We can no longer stand in the ground that we stand today. It's a massive call to, to change inside of our industry and our industry is slow to adopt. But we are trying to adopt and I'll tell you some of the things that we're trying to do. What's the size of the prize? And I'm just going to talk, I'm going to give you some examples and I'm going to talk to you about some things I've done on the back of an envelope. I think there is one to nine billion dollars of value that's sitting inside of our industry that we can use and obtain through technology. And the way that I've done that is I have about 63 people working for me in finance and IT. I've given my staff the challenge of having 15 people do the same thing for the size of company that we are. Now what that really means to me is I want to actually grow by the same amount and keep my, my 63 people. So we want to be five, six, seven times bigger than we are, but not have to add a lot of staff to do that. And that's not the traditional model. This is quite different. So we believe, or I believe, that that value exists out there, and I'm going to show you a couple of examples in terms of where we see this happening and how it actually works. Here is a standard process that happens in finance uh, for us today, and for those who are in the industry, this will be a kind of common, easy cartoon for you to understand. Oil or gas get produced at the wellhead, goes into a gas, gas gathering system, or it goes into an oil battery, goes to a sales point, gets to markets, then we do, the marketer sends us a payment, we do a whole bunch of reconciliation, we use a bunch of systems, field data capture, in our world we use metrics, and Petronex, and Energy Link, and generally the first time we send out this information to people, we have disputes. And we have tons and tons of people who handle disputes. It's not very efficient. This is one of the areas where you're going to find there's a lot of opportunity from a business perspective in terms of doing things in a much more effective way. And this is where my one to nine billion dollars comes from. <coughs> and this is my point. Where, is it, where are all these things happening? Well, they're called in the world of blockchain notaries. <laughs> these are people that check the checkers. So you have people checking the checkers, that check the checkers, that check the checkers. And they don't do it in just one company. They do it in every company. And you sit and you think about, you know, we have partners in three partners in a well, eight partners in a well, ten partners in a well. They have all the same people checking the same things. Doesn't seem very efficient to me. Doesn't seem as an, as an industry we should be doing these kinds of things. And these things exist not just in procurement and payables, but in operations, human resources, finance, JV, land, expo everywhere inside of my organization this exists. And I actually believe that in the, in the, in the oil company of the future, in the, in the corporation of the future, you can probably run companies with three to five people because we are going to have a workforce that will be a workforce that works to do a task and gets paid to do the task. And you can work for anybody to do that task. That's my belief about where we're going. It's not happening tomorrow. I'm not going to tell you it happens tomorrow, but that's what I think we as an industry, we as a group have to get ready for and understand. This is a little example of uh, one of the things. We were the first blockchain company in the world that we're aware of that did a freehold royalty transaction using blockchain. So these, if you, for those of you who are in the technology world, can kind of see that the cartoons are really blockchain-style cartoons. And so we actually believe 
that you can have an internal blockchain because within this, in my own organization, I probably have 130 different systems, applications that we use. I probably have as many well lists as I have applications. So we have a real need to synchronize our own data within the context of our, of our existing systems that we have internally. And then when I go outside, it even gets more complicated. And we have partners, we have marketers, we have regulators, we as the operator have a requirement. It's our belief that in the future, this kind of environment is going to exist where data, once it passes a sensor, will be made automatically available to all of the people that require it, both internally and externally. And that's what this is intended to represent. I'm also fundamentally a, a very big believer in smart contracts. So I'm assuming everybody knows what a smart contract is. It's really a function. That's all it is that we all agree on in terms of how it works. And with that smart contract, we put it onto a distributed ledger, <coughs> and then we can use it anywhere. We're working in the context of private blockchain, not public blockchain. Again, if anybody wants to talk to me about all these things, I'm happy to have a conversation. But the concept of blockchain, I think people make a lot of discussion about how, how complicated it is. It's actually a very simple concept. It's just a distributed ledger. There's a lot of technology around, you know, the hash 286, all those kind of wonderful things. But ultimately, it's a settlement mechanism between two parties. That's all it is. It's fairly simple. It's easy to do. And what the beauty of it is, it takes out the notary component, which I was talking about a little bit earlier. What do I believe is going to happen? And so I use this all the time when I talk to people. And that's a very smart person told me this. They said, if you don't know where you're going, any road will lead you there. So I showed you the first slide to say, I think this is where we're going inside of this industry, inside of many industries. This is the second part of that slide, which is I actually believe that for energy companies, every molecule of energy will basically be put on a passport and we will know where it goes every time it passes a sensor. And once that information is in the passport, everybody that deserves to get it will get it. That's a fundamental belief that I have, and that's where I believe this industry is likely to go. And what that means, though, for people who like the cryptos and all those wonderful things, and I don't talk a lot about cryptos, but what that means is you can arbitrage anywhere from a reserve all the way to when it's sold, and probably to the carbon that produces off of it. That is where you're eventually going to get to. So what does it mean for the industry? Full transparency. So everybody will know what everybody else is doing. Who should be the most interested in this? Anybody? Governments. They want to know where the taxes are. They want to know where the environmental spill is. Why wouldn't they want to know about this? We believe this is occurring. We already are talking to the Saskatchewan government, quite interested in our blockchain work that we're doing. We believe the Alberta government will follow soon. But we think that this is a natural place for it to go. Current reporting to stakeholders. I don't know in the, in the slide, in the picture of the cartoon I had in terms of the way the data flows. For a partner to get his data today, it's 90 days minimum. For some of us who aren't really good operators, it might be 180 days. So you can think as a partner, I don't know what the heck's going on. I'm, as an accountant, I have to estimate what that is, which is wrong, and then I have to redo it again when I get it. Again, doesn't make a lot of sense from my perspective. Elimination of redundant and legacy systems. I actually see in this environment a lot of the apps that we have actually go away. We don't need them anymore. There's no requirement. And these things don't just require blockchain, they require what you were just listening to, AI. Because I believe AI can solve a lot of our issues that we deal with today. Because they're just things that we do by rote. They have rules associated with them. And we know, and I'm going to give you a few examples of the things that we're doing around that today and, and where it's leading to. Uh, reduction of staff on low value activities. One of the big things that people get concerned about when I talk is my 63 to 15, they go like, oh my God, my job's going away, right? There's a study that's come out from the World Economic Forum. Based on the new technologies that we're putting in place today, they believe there'll be twice as many jobs as we have today. There is a transition period though we have to go through and we are in the transition. But don't think you can live in the same old job you used to have. It's changing and it's changing dramatically. And so I would encourage all of you to get educated, understand it, know where it's going, figure out what you have to do to be ready. 
and there's a series of books and, and things around the skills you need, and one of them is adaptability and change. So we all have to learn how to get a lot more adaptable to change and the things that we have to do. Lower cost to support the assets. That's my one to nine billion dollars of value in this marketplace only. I'm not talking about worldwide, I'm talking Calgary. We believe that there is that opportunity to really improve the way that we do our work. And we're gonna increase the velocity of money and information. And that always increases the amount of money that's spent and that we can use to do other things that we wanna do within the context of our industry. These are the, the value of what we get based on what Keith Steve says, whether that's worth anything or not to you. Um, what are the other things that are required from a technology perspective? We believe the industrial internet of things is here, it is real, it is here to stay, and you better get on board. There are sensors on everything. The question is, is how do you collect the data? Where do you collect the data? How do you know what the data means? Where do you use it? How do you correlate it? There's a million things. Is it on the edge and we leave it out there? Do we bring it to the center? There's a whole lot of things associated with the data that we need to sort out. Robotics. And you know, it's, uh, I have a fellow that works for me, I love him to death. Um, he loves robotics because first of all, it's cheap and it's fast. And we can find out basically, but I said to him, this is really step one of a two-step or three-step process. If you do robot, robotic process automation, what you're doing is defining the process. And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. We do production accounting. We do upload, download of data. Should be pretty standard, right? Everybody should be able to upload and download data. Well, we found out it's 13 steps. We have 13 people to do it. They do it 13 different ways. So we've standardized it. We use robotic process automation. We standardize it. Now the data gets uploaded. It gets uploaded 20 times faster than a human being can do it. That was the first step. I'll go through. I got more stories on that one. But anyways, that's robotic process automation. What is robotic process automation for people who don't know? It's a macro on steroids. That's all it is. Gives you access to all your databases. Basically allows you to do some pretty simple kinds of things. To actually do some complicated things, depending on where you are in the process. But there's a whole bunch of things that we'll do for you. Machine learning, this is actually you know, another really fascinating area that we got into. And uh, you know, we think that this has massive opportunity for us. And for us, machine learning is about reading contracts. So we have tried some software, we've tried a couple pieces of software. Um, one of the things that we have to do last year was IFRS 16, which is you know, identifying leases that we have to reclassify for accounting purposes. Set up a liability, set up the asset. Well, we had 1,600 leases that we had to go through and read manually. We trained a computer to read the contracts, and we read all the contracts in 42 hours. Would have taken six months for us to do it. We have 10,000 contracts, 3 million documents inside of our system digitized today. Imagine how machine learning can revolutionize the way that we do that work and the work that we actually physically do. So we are looking at how do we ingest contracts today. Today they get sent to the person, the person reads it when he has time, then they translate it, then they put it into our system. We're looking at it to say, can you read it, Mr. Computer, with 99% accuracy, I might add, and then how do we translate it into a function that becomes a smart contract, which is the second step in the process. So we think there is massive opportunity within the context of the machine learning that we see today. We've tried a different, couple of different products. We think they're a little too expensive today, but we do see that it, it will revolutionize the way we do our work within the context of everything we do at NAL. Cognitive supercomputing, thank you, IBM. They're a great partner of ours. We sit in the uh, uh, energy uh, resource group. Uh, we were one of the first cohorts to go through it. It's a fantastic process for those who haven't been through it. I'm not here to advertise for them, but I, I would say that we have the stuff I'm going to talk about after this isn't about the technology, it's about the change that you have to get through. But there is such a massive amount of resistance, and it's interesting, I was, went to a Wiseman Institute presentation, and they talked about artificial intelligence. Wiseman is an Israeli university, one of the top in the world on uh, applied research. And they said the biggest problem with doing artificial intelligence 
is when you're working with professionals. You've got a big change process that you have to think about. And I know uh, we talked about it here a little bit earlier, but that is a significant component of what you're going to do if you're in this space and if you're trying to, to drive forward any changes. People have been doing the same thing in our industry for at least 60 years. They may have a new shiny object that they do it with, but essentially it's the same thing. We're actually trying to get them to do something different and to change the way they think and to change the way they do things. And then the last piece is blockchain, and I already talked to you about blockchain. We did the freehold royalty. We see it going into JV. We see it as basically taking over the majority. We have about 20 people that kind of work in our production accounting and JV areas, and we think that when we have blockchain working the way that it should, from field data capture all the way through to our internal partners as well as external, that we will probably be down to 10 people just because of the efficiency of what has to happen. The other story I was going to tell you with regard to robotic process automation is we balance 1,200 facilities and wells every month, and we did robotic process automation to do that. And our production accountants, the first thing out of their mouth was said, never happened. We did 400 the first month. Their jaws hit the table. We will do 85% of all of our facilities by the end of the year using robotic process automation, step one. This is what I was talking about. So we're trying to think about old way, new way, and one of the things I said to you, if you don't know where you're going, any road will lead you there, and I said a very smart person told me that. That was my mother, by the way. <laughs> Probably the smartest person I know. But I think it's true. And so the slides I gave you at the beginning is to think about if you're standing on a rock five, ten years out, what does this look like? And what do I have to do to get there? And I need you to think through what changes that means. I'm going to give you a very quick example, and it'll be one of the slides that go forward. It'll have the numbers on it. We have procure to pay is kind of a standard process that happens in accounting. Everybody does it. We process between 70 and 120,000 invoices a year. The traditional way that that works is it goes to an accounts payable group. Well, it goes to somebody to say, yes, I approve it. Then it goes to an accounts payable group, and they code it. And then somebody else will generally put it in. It could be a data processor puts it in. And I came in 2007 and said, that doesn't make any sense to me. Like, where is the value in that process? So we designed a procure-to-pay system that basically nobody touches the invoice. We need four pieces of information to make that happen. We need to know who ordered it. We need to know where did it go to, which cost center did it go to, and what's the major minor that would be associated with that. Today, 99% of my invoices come in electronically, are never touched, and 97% of them are paid with EFT. That was worth $70 million to us as an organization. And I said, if I ever put another accounts payable person into the company, I'm going to shoot the person that hires them. There is, and listen, I don't dislike accounts payable people, but there's a lot more valuable work I can get them to do than the work that they were doing before. It just makes sense. I, I'm, I'm talk to you a little bit about this, because this, it's not the technology, it's not all the wonderful things that you see every day. If you get divorced, if you, you know, have some major event occur in your life, this is, this is what happens. And I will tell you that when you try to change technology, it's the same thing. So I'm going to tell you in two, and I'll go through the timeline, but I'll tell you today, and we'll skip over when I get there. In 2014, when the price collapsed, we had an offsite. We went out, we talked about what we needed to do. We came back to uh, the rest of our managers and to the staff, and we said, this is what we got to do. We need to, make, we need to find $100 million inside of our world to kind of equate us back to where we were. And we make about $200 million in cash flow annually, or cash generated annually. And uh, the people that sat at the table looked at us in disbelief. Then they got angry, you know, about three months later. And then they started telling us what they really thought, which was, you guys are all crazy. You don't know what you're doing. Who ever told you that you could do this kind of thing? Three years later, we finally got them to a place where we started to make change. But this is a common phenomena that you're going to go through in any kind of change process that has big change like we're talking, especially outside your silo change. When you cross silos, 
that's like a recipe for disaster. And I'll give you some of our rules of thumb about how you handle that. But it is a major issue for you to go outside of somebody's silo and then start to say, okay, now you need to do this for me. They don't like that very much. Remember, they've been doing it for 60 years this way and it works quite well. We use this curve to really help us through the change process. It's a very common curve. I think it's, uh, I don't know, probably 40 years old. So it's not anything that's new. It's called the innovation diffusion curve. And really the point of this curve is to really talk about how do you accelerate change inside of an organization. Because I think as our previous speaker just, Emma talked to, if you don't get over that, you're just a digital tourist. You're just trying a bunch of crap. Excuse my language. You really need to get the early majority on board in order to make any transition occur. And if you can't get them there, you aren't going anywhere. And you're just spending money without any purpose. So we look at that. We try to do cross-functional brainstorming. We look for opportunities. So the other thing that I think you people fall in the trap of is they look for incremental opportunities. I don't look for incremental opportunities. I'm looking for 10 times what I currently have. If I don't get 10 times and I only get five, I'm pretty happy. But if I look for 2%, I'm not likely to get one. <clears throat> and what I need people to think about is big, th big thoughts, not small thoughts, and how you get them to change in terms of what's going on. Autonomous teams, we try to stay on message, and you'll see this as we go forward. If you are divided inside of your silos and the person at the top isn't on the same page, your chance of success goes down dramatically, exponentially. You need to have everybody on the same page. So this is how we think about it, and we have a center of excellence that basically works through this series, with, especially with the people that are doing the projects that we're working on. Here's the timeline I talked to you about, 2015, we did this decision to transform. We came up with five different, I'll give you three of the five uh, things that we were trying to do, just to show you that they're not small. We wanted to improve our cash generation by 30%. We wanted to reduce our carbon emissions by 50%. And we wanted to reduce our environmental f footprint by 50%. Now those are no small targets to achieve. And I'll talk to you a little bit about how far we've come in some of those things. The environmental one is proving to be <coughs> more difficult than the other one. <coughs> but the other ones are moving quite nicely for us. 2015, we had a staff reduction because we took over a 50% hit in our cash, cash flow. Prices were dropping. Carbon tax was coming in. We were trying to drive change. And as I told you in the story before, people thought we were crazy. Because what does the oil industry think about? Price is coming back. I'm just going to wait. I'll fire a few secretaries. I'll get rid of some administration people. Guess what? This one's not coming back. You need to be certain about what you're going to do. <coughs> one of the things that started to help us is in 2017, just before 2017, and setting our budget, we started to say, well, why are these people resisting us so much? And what we found is people would say, hey, listen, I got a full-time job. What am I going to do this other stuff for? You know, I get paid to produce oil and gas. I don't get paid to do this other stuff. So what we did is we put in a budget for them that didn't take away from their existing budget. And guess what? We also incentivized them. We said, your short-term incentive, guess what? 30% of it's related to this. And it gets people thinking a little differently when they know they're going to get paid differently. We put in a collaborative office, which was also very beneficial to us. So, and heresy probably to lots of people on the gas, but we took down the walls. Sorry. And that's because people actually talk to each other when the walls are down. And you start to work together and you start to break up the silos. So we took the walls down. 30% improvement in productivity and 30% improvement in the fact that we need 30% less space. That's a pretty good return, I'd say. We built our first robot in 2017, and I already gave you the, the proof of concept. I think we have eight ongoing. We've just signed up to take 22,000 22, hours of work out of our systems using robotic process automation. We've just approved that. We did the first blockchain transaction. By the end of this year, 
all of our right freehold, freehold royalties will be done in a production environment using blockchain. We'll be the first one in the world that's actually done that using blockchain. We see from there our other royalty partners will get on and we're going to J joint venture after that and look at our other partners to go through that kind of process. We're using IBM Watson. I think you heard a couple of stories. Our story is uh, we looked at down downhole pumps. Um, the view was that we could extend the life of downhole pumps. We did the data assessment readiness that needed to get done. We've been doing the work on uh, how that looks. They've done the um, look back to see what it would do. Uh, we had a 15% improvement. I think it was 15 million, $17 million of value that we think we can create through that. And I was just told the other day, although I haven't seen the paperwork, that that's increased in the last uh, three weeks. So it's a 25% improvement. So the AI really works. It has issues that you have to sort out, but it's no reason to stop because you don't have the data. It's about finding the data you have and then making it better. So the other things that we've also learned is, is the way that you make your data better is to find a project that creates value and then create a series of projects and then you can cross correlate your data, especially if it works together. So we're really excited about what we're doing within the context of that. We have a four year agreement uh, with IBM and uh, we have a number of advisors that we're looking at kind of trying to create. And just so the wild, crazy ideas that are out there that we're thinking about, we have three production engineers that manage 3,500 wells for us. They optimize a well once a year. We believe that we can create algorithms that will optimize our wells by the second, all year long, every well. Secondly, we're now looking, and you talked a little bit about this, our geological information and how we can high grade our, our sites and what, what, our, what the reserves look like and what we can actually drill. We think there's tremendous opportunity inside of that. We're also going to the rest of the downhole equipment, working on that. So there are just a series of things that are coming and they look very, very exciting for us. I talked to you about the machine learning. That is one of those areas where I think it's just gonna go crazy once we start to kind of really drive after it. And then we put a COE, which is a center of excellence, and the center of excellence is really there to support all of this, to make sure that we move forward in a, in a reasonable way. So this is um, not digital tourism, unfortunately, because we measure everything. If it doesn't have a number, it's probably not something we're going to do, and if that number isn't something that's significant. What's interesting, every one of the projects that we've done, the return is greater than drilling a well for us. So doing technology has massive value in our organization. I'm gonna walk you through, I won't, no, I'm, I'll walk you through four or five of these so I can kind of give you a sense. IoT, IoT for us is, uh, we call it operate by exception. So prior to two years ago, we had, for people in the industry will know this, we have operators, operators go to wells, they go to the wells every day. And that's primarily because they have environmental concerns, they wanna see if anything's broken, all that kind of stuff. Well, we, we looked at how much time does an operator spend driving? Quick estimate. Too much is the right answer. 30% of the time is in a truck behind a windshield. So that kind of doesn't make sense to me. They could be doing something else. So we said we put video cameras on the site. We put microphones on the site. We put pump off controllers on the site. And there's a series of other technologies. That we there's 700 pieces of data that exist at any one site that we have. Now we're looking at all that data and saying, where should it exist? How do we use it? What should it correlate to other things for? So let me just go back to the example, the simple example of just putting a microphone, a video camera, and a pump off control. We've reduced site visitations by 66%. And we've increased our production on those sites by one and a half percent. It's phenomenal the value that it creates for us. Uh, I talked to you about robotic process automation and some of the things that we're doing there. We've got up to, based on some of the processes that we're kind of looking at, up to 45 times improvement in terms of people's time, effort, and requirements that are spent. And what's interesting is you're not getting rid of interesting work, you're getting rid of mundane work, and people like it. They, don't, they no longer have to go in and click through a whole bunch of things. They're actually, they come in the morning, guess what? The wells are all ready. They can do their work. 
it's actually interesting work for them. Uh, I told you about the royalty transactions that we do. We, we've got, um, I think, I 200 million records in terms of our business intelligence environment that we're using today. And that's really helping us. Again, these are the correlations. These are the, uh, the data of, tr you know, we have systems where we know the truth comes from this system and it's the primary source that we use associated with it. Um, I talked to you about one of our objectives was to reduce our carbon intensity by 50%. This year alone, we've reduced it by 27%, and we believe within the next two years, we'll have reached our goal. When you focus on something, you can get there. We use geosteering. I don't know if anybody knows what geosteering is that works in the industry, but basically you used to have well site geologists and they used to sit on the well and they would basically look after the well. And you can do all that work from Calibrate today on a computer and you can be in zone 95% of the time and you're going to have a much better well than you do having somebody sit manually do it from the field and it saves you money. I talked about the collaborative workspace. I've talked about the machine learning. Those are the things. We have four million digital documents. The things that people don't talk about about digital documents is they're heavy. They take up space and they um, cost you a lot of money. Put them on digital. Makes it go faster when you're trying to move into this new world. But digital in a PDF form is just another electronic paper copy. You need to really get it into a form that you can start to use it. So that's what we do, and that's what I call um, by the numbers. We currently have about 23 projects going on te from technology, all of these different technologies, for between 55 and $75 million, and our target was 100 in terms of cash flow. And we anticipate we will get to 100 within the next two years. And if the ones that we have don't work, we'll find ones that do. So that's our story. Here's the things that you need to think about if you're in the place that I'm in. The things that make it don't not work is the culture, people who focus on the past. They're siloed, fragmented, they believe in the legacy, they're risk averse to making change, and it's manual and a lot of heavy lifting. We are trying to drive a culture of innovation. We talk about agile, we talk about how we use our technology the key for us as a CEO, as soon as you get the CEO on board, things start to change. Because now you're not fighting the mom and dad syndrome where one guy wants to go and the other guy doesn't. We do know you have to have new core competencies. So finding out what those competencies are, really driving to them. We do believe that uh, data scientists are critical to what we have to do in the future. So we want to see more of those people. We don't believe in big projects. We believe in projects that make money. And so finding projects, and I think this was talked about earlier in the presentation by Emma, is start small, get your wins, take the money you win, invest it in something else. Makes sense. And the, and the second thing is you got to stop this single functional groups, get people together. They don't like each other, but you got to get them together and you got to find a way to, to help them understand why we need everybody in the same team. Here's our playbook. Get educated, find people like IBM or other people who have the knowledge that you don't have and that you can use. We like using a smart risk budget. Make sure there's money to make, allow people to do the things they need to do. Find somebody who's willing to take a risk and be a champion. Talk to you, start small, do a proof of concept, make sure it works, be agile, find the early wins. I go back to measure everything because you need to know whether you're winning or losing. Establish we a uh, center of excellence, and this one my boss loves is fail cheap. If you're gonna screw up, do it cheaply. Here's our final message to you. Uh, good enough is just not good enough anymore. We gotta do a lot more with what we have. It's gotta stop at the top. It's gotta be persistent on your vision. You're probably gonna be misunderstood for a long time because people don't get it, they don't understand. Be prepared for a lot of disbelief and resistance and look at it as a journey. There's no final ending spot to this. That's kind of how it works for us. Anyways, I'm happy to take questions. If there's any questions, we, what we did is we did a process with IBM to start with to find out where the highest value, easiest ones to attain were. It just wasn't one of the top processes. But labor and maintenance is a huge issue for us in trying to get at that. 
I don't know if you work downtown, but I think everybody is having data breach and security issues these days. Um, uh, how do you manage it? I think you're managing it the best you can. I mean, you probably know about more about how the security works than I know. One of the things that we are looking at though, and I think uh, someone, another speaker talked about this is, we think cloud gives us a lot more opportunity to start to do some things in a much more effective way. And so we are looking at bringing our cloud strategy forward to push out into the cloud, because it does two things. It makes us more agile. We can bring more apps to work. We think it helps in the security side. Now, we have to set our own standards. And just for your information, we work for an insurance company. This insurance company has a trillion dollars of assets under management. Security is kind of big for them. Um, so we are very, very attuned to the security, but I wouldn't say that we have um, been immune to some of the things, the phishing and the security issues that exist out there. And the biggest issue is how do we manage all that data, especially in a non-prem versus non-on-prem kind of environment. So I don't have an answer for you other than it is a big, big issue for us and we are looking at a series of ways to kind of do that. We brought in probably a third of our budget last year was around security. There, I wouldn't say they're required. I told you there's 700 pieces of information. Those, most of those are gathered through sensors. Some of that's manual. Um, what's happened, is, so the way that it's worked my understanding, sorry, I've only had 40 years in the industry, so I might be wrong on this. But it's really related to equipment, it's related to an app, it's related to this. So they're very disjointed today. So we're collecting them in all kinds of places. You know, a lot of them are collected in cards in the field. They may get transferred. Yeah. So we are trying to change that very specifically. We're now looking at edge computing. Where, where do you actually leave the data? Should you bring all of the data back? Uh, not as much, I mean there is because you know, you're getting into a whole lot of conversation here. There's brownfield and greenfield. And we have a lot of brownfield and brownfield would be everything that's old and existing. So how do you, you know, what we're working on right now is trying to figure out is how do we convert our brownfield to greenfield or to new field, if you will. And we're actually going through a process to say there will be certain things that can't convert and certain things that can. And we're looking to sell or basically clean up the sites that we can't no longer, because we need to have productivity. And just to give you context about how big a problem it is for us is our production per well is less than 10 barrels. So we have a lot of low productivity wells and lots of water. It's a fantastic question. I'm not sure I have the answer, but I'm gonna tell you what I, the way that we're working it. Um, my belief is our industry works in the context of saying everybody has to move at the same pace. I don't believe that. I'm trying to create something viral where they can see the value that we create and will want to join. So we're creating something that we think others will join. And we already have interest from probably five or six other parties that want to join. You know, Prairie Sky is one, Freehold is the other. And then we had Crescent Point is, is interested. Saskatchewan government has some interest. We probably have four or five other names that are on the list. But they're kind of, you know, our industry is one that doesn't want to be first, it wants to be second, right? So we're taking the bull step. Yeah. And I have a picture I didn't put up here, but it's Alexander Graham Bell, and I said telephones don't work with one person, you have to have two. Maybe. <laughs> 15 people. You know, including my D the DMS group. Yeah, so, so we believe in selective outsourcing, so we use a lot of outsourcing services to help us, right? So, th so there's, a, there's a ton of that. We're not sure that that's the right answer today because we think we can get managed services through cloud yeah. in a different way, which is gonna change the focus of the people that we have in IT from managing iron and apps to really bringing in new apps and, and helping people get up on some of the new things that we're trying to do. There'll be more standards-based, security requirements, those kinds of things, so it's gonna change the entire world that they live in. Now, we're not there yet, but uh, they're, they're kind of getting my message, I think, so. Uh, no, our data center is out, so Q, we use Q9 basically for our hardware, is where we store all our hardware. So it's colo in terms of where it is, and and today, uh, like I said, we have 135 apps. I mean, we're looking in the cloud to go to, go to SaaS. So you don't really get your big bump unless you're all SaaS. So there's lots of issues associated with getting to SaaS. Now, as I said, when I 
and my opening story when I worked at Gulf is we converted from a VMMB environment with a raised floor on, if you know Gulf Canada Square, half of the, half of the building was raised floor on one floor, or half of a floor was, one, was a raised floor. As I said, some 85% of my costs came in the last 15% of the things that I had to get off the VM, MV environments inside of that world. And the same thing occurs with the SaaS, the fine SaaS. Now, I am prepared to move all my apps to SaaS. I'm just not sure the users are prepared to go there yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, no, I, that's a great question. I'll, I'll give you the RPA kind of example that we have in terms of how we change the silo kind of th thought process. When we, we did greenhouses, we used Deloitte's, so again, Hopefully I'm not uh, doing a paid advertisement for people, but we used Deloitte to kind of do it. They did what they called a greenhouse for us. Um, we were starting in production accounting, but what we did when we went in with the production accounting staff is we brought in all of the different disciplines that surrounded it. Joint venture, um, a bunch of operational people in the field, and it was it's simply a brainstorming se session. And what was interesting, what came out of that is, yeah, we did some things for PA, but all of these different silos said, hey, we want that too. So we came out of that, I think we had 16 projects, and I think by the end of it we had like 46 different things that people wanted to do. And the, the more interesting thing is they actually started talking to each other. And so people, you know, we have this center of excellence, or I have this fellow who does our, our innovation, and uh, he was saying people were grabbing him in the hallways saying, hey, I want my project, which was kind of a neat feeling rather than trying to push technology on somebody they were asking for. We hire them. <laughs> um, you know what's, uh, I'm going to answer it a little bit differently than probably the way you're asking. Um, what we're finding is, uh, I probably have talked to 45 different companies downtown, and I've probably talked in 20 forums around the city. People are coming to our company and asking if they can work there. And why did they come? They want to work in the new technology. I actually, this is going to be a funny story for you. We had a gentleman that used to work for us who, for some, won't give it great, go into the reason, had to leave the organization. He was probably my hardest guy to convince about the things that we were doing. Guess what the first thing on his resume is? All the new technology he was putting in. People want to work in this space. And as I say to them, I mean, this is the future. This is where, whether they're working at our company or somewhere else, they are creating value for themselves in terms of what they get out of this. And if you stick your head in the sand and say, I want to use a piece of paper and write it down again and give it to my accountant or give it to my clerical person, or that world doesn't exist. And you know, I'm very much in a self-serve mode. So if, you know, if we've got the data, you should be able to get it. And you should know how to make it work. People. People, no, honestly, I, I'm, I'm not, I, I put the cultural change slide up for a reason. Because I would say, you know, I've been doing this for, I don't know, Dale, how long? A long time, right? <laughs> Too many years. Um, but the hardest part that you have, you know, I went and talked to a series of private equity people uh, two months ago. And basically, you know, they told me their companies are failing, they're not doing well. And I went to them and I said, well, here's some things that you got to do. You know, here's the things that I would do if I were you to kind of move your organizations along. And I said, but here's the, here's the problem. It's going to change relationships. It's going to change the way you do your business. It's going to, I go, no, I can't do that. I'm not prepared to, to make that change. So my view is the pain isn't big enough yet. I think this industry is going to change quite dramatically. And, you know, I think there was 500 plus oil companies downtown. My guess is there'll be about a third of that in five years. This industry is consolidating and changing dramatically. And so we have a whole series of things as an industry we have to solve. One of them is the environmental issues. You know, we have the Orphan Well Fund, and that is going to get taxed in a massive way. We have to solve these problems. We've kicked that can down the road for a long time. We have to fix it. So I'm not opposed to fixing the problems, but don't tax me so badly I can't have any money to fix the problems. And, um, and we think there's, we have a, ver a lot of very, very smart people in this industry that know what they're doing, but they need a chance. So give us a chance. That's all we're asking for. Any, uh, yes, yeah, she's asking, during the journey, was there any new risks that we encountered and how did we mitigate them? I mean, most of, the, my, my, most of my risks sit around people. Like the technology doesn't really, 
you know, uh, cause a, a big problem at the end of the day. And, it, and I would say, the, how do you mitigate them? It's getting everybody on the same page. Until people are on the same page and they're moving in the same direction, and I would say the way you mitigate them is you try to help them, you try to train them, you try to give them the information they need, but ultimately if they can't move, you've got to make a change. Because you can't actually physically move unless people move with you. We've already had an audit of our blockchain. We did Deloitte. <coughs> yeah, I actually think technology is going to do a lot of your auditing for you, to tell you the truth. And, and actually, we've started, I have socks that I have to be compliant with, so we are starting to work through how we actually do all of our working papers, all of our controls, using technology in, in terms of doing that. But that, if you're talking blockchain, blockchain's interesting because it's really, it's really about the security around the ability to change what's already been created. So you have to validate that the original coding makes sense, and then you gotta make sure that nobody can change the coding. Because in a distributed environment, basically, there's no way that you can have something that doesn't work. That's just the way that the blockchain works. So it's actually not as complicated as you think from an auditing perspective in order to get to where you need to be in a blockchain world. Sorry, what do you well, the adoption rate is very low because there's not a lot of blockchain adoption at this stage of the game. But I think it will come very quickly. Like, we already have two different firms that want to basically audit us. We've had a series of conversations about what are the controls that we need to audit within the context and the, and the frame of this. Because it is a whole new world that we're actually working into and understanding in terms of what it is. It's, but I, I actually see it as simpler than what we currently have. You don't have so much paper to go through anymore. Anyways, I want to ask this lady here has a question, so I want to get it to her. That's a fantastic question, because it's one of the questions I asked as well. So, um, it, it's very, so the question was, you know, with microphones on site at a, at a well site, what are we monitoring for and what are we doing with the data and how do we analyze the data? For some of the folks who have been around a long time, they'll know that if they go to an operator, the operator will tell you, I can tell you when the compressor isn't working properly or the pump has a problem or, or that kind of stuff. And this was really intended for them, so that we could say, listen to the, to the information. Now, I would say there are, we haven't done this yet, but I think there are frequencies and things that we can use within the context of the data, and that's what we, so even with the pictures, so it's int I'm gonna change it to pictures a little bit, because it's kind of the same thing. You know, the reason you have the pictures or the cameras is to see whether you have staining, and the staining tells you whether you have any kind of pollution problem associated with the site. And for the first two weeks, the guys thought this was fantastic. They could look at their picture. But imagine staring at the same picture for eight hours, right? So now we're saying, okay, we want to see what the anomaly is to the picture is really the only thing that we're interested in. So as we get better at this, but the first part was getting them used to it, interested in it, and, and an advantage that we had that we didn't even think about. So we have less site visitation. But we had this, uh, an operator come to us and say, Listen, I used to get an alert, it's two o'clock in the morning, I have to get up, get in my truck, drive out to the well site. He says, I was scared to death, I didn't know what I was getting into. Could have had sour gas, could have had a, you know, something that was dramatically, drastically wrong. He says, now it's a, he says, I get up and look at the camera, I'm in my truck, 50 minutes later I'm back in bed and I'm sleeping like a baby. So you have ancillary benefits that you weren't even thinking about around safety and things like that because of the technology that we're putting in place. So it's just, it's win-win in so many different ways, and I think we'll find the microphones are gonna have the same kind of wins for us. Yeah, so the first and foremost is, um, it's interesting, I talked to my investment banker just the other day, and he says, what you have in town today is zombie companies. So what's a zombie company? They have no capital, they have no cash flow, they have no capital, and their production is declining. Eventually the shareholders will get fed up with that, and so you're going to have a consolidation of those entities, and the banks are f gonna force that. That will happen, essentially, where it is. Second thing I think that you're gonna see, and, and we're starting to see this because of the social pressure, is all the environmental liabilities and what we have to do with those and how we're gonna manage them. We don't do a good job of that today within the context of the industry. That is going to change. My belief is the classifications will become a lot better. We'll start to understand where we have big problems, where we have small problems, how we solve those problems in a more effective way than we do today. 
As again, I was just talking to my friend uh, who I've known for many truck at 50 miles or 100 miles to some place. That's a waste of money and time. There's got to be a wetter, better way to deal with soil remediation. And so I think you're going to start to see technologies come about that we actually get focused on. Today, we're not focused on it. We're focused on drilling oil and gas wells. We're not focused on cleaning up our environmentals. And we will get better at those kinds of things. The third thing I think that is going to happen is with the technologies that we see is a lot of what I would call the infrastructure stuff. And let me, what I, I believe will happen is all of this useless work that we do, and a lot of it is data gathering. IBM will tell you this in terms of some of the studies. 90% of a professional's work is based on finding the data, gathering the data, and putting it into something they can analyze. 10% of their work is doing what they were trained to do. And so you are going to be, as a professional, doing what you were trained to do, not all this other garbage that you basically have to do today, and that's going to change the industry dramatically. And the people that don't adopt won't be here. It's a really good question, and again, I, I should have IBM tell you the story, but I'll tell my version of the story first, okay? So we, we had IBM come in, we did a discovery phase where we talked about what kind of projects could we actually do, how would they actually physically work. We talked about downhole pumps as being one of the things, and the engineers sat in the room. Can't do it as good as me, right? Today, that engineer is saying, the savings that you're projecting aren't even half of what we're going to get. Because he's gone through the process, he's now a believer, he said he'd never go back to doing it the way he used to. But you have a fairly, remember I talked to you about early adopters? Early majority? We're still in the early adopter phase, we're not at the early majority stage. And it will come. Uh, I, I can tell you, that we've done a couple of projects with certain uh, midstream companies. I don't think they see it the same way because they get paid differently than we do, right? I think they will eventually get there. I think there's a consolidation coming inside of that space as well. And, um, but right now, they're, they're not in the same motivation. They still have capital. They still have people that want to invest in them. Maybe not in Western Canada anymore, but <laughs> there's lots of midstream companies that are out there that... Um, you know, still are re doing reasonably well through the process. But uh, another good question. Okay, I'm, oh, okay, one more. Is there any more? Going, going, gone. I'll let you guys go home. Thank you so much. You're a great audience.